Good afternoon. Um, it's really lovely to be with you today. Um, you should be able to see me. I'll switch, I'll switch kind of where my eyeliner is, but I'm on Facebook here. Hi, and live on Instagram here. Um, my name's Fiona English. I'm the Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer of the King's Head Theatre. Um, and I have been for the last three years. So um, hopefully today I can give you a bit of an insight into what it's like at the minute to run a pub theatre um, at this time, um, look after our amazing staff team of 10, um, and also answer any questions that you might have about my job, um, the theatre itself, um, the King's Head, what we do, um, and what maybe the coming year looks like for us as well. Um, I'm joining you um, from my flat in Paddington, so welcome to my, my version of uh, the famous Zoom bookshelf. Um, so hopefully you can read some titles and judge me as you like while I do this. Um, also made myself a cup of tea for this in a King's Head Theatre mug to be on brand. Um, but um, yeah, welcome. Um, what I'll do is I'll start, um, if that's of interest, I'll start by talking a bit about um, my job, um, what it looks like and how I got to do the job that I do today. So um, my career path. And then if you've got any questions, if you're on Instagram or on Facebook, just pop them in the chat and I will do my best to uh, answer them as we go through. Um, so I um, I run the day-to-day -day of the King's Head. Um, and so most arts organisations will have two um, people at the, the helm as such. Um, you tend to have a business person and an artistic person who sit side by side and together run the organisation. And so for the King's Head, that's um, an artistic director in the form of Adam Spubbery Marr. Um, it's actually his last week at the King's Head after 10 years with us. Um, we wish him all the best as he moves on to an exciting new future. Um, and then it's um, co-run with the artistic director with um, usually someone who's responsible for the business side. Um, often things um, like income, expenditure, staff team, HR, policies and procedures, strategy, that kind of thing. Um, and that's what my job is at the King's Head. And so for some venues, that will that role will be an executive producer. Um, at the King's Head, we have an executive director, which is what I do. Um, and that's specifically because um, our artistic director um, is really great at programming and producing and putting on work. And the work, the role that was therefore required for the King's Head was someone who was more business focused, um, able to specifically think a lot about um, alternative models of income generation, um, diversifying uh, income and um, alternative strategies um, alongside um, a lot of HR support and looking after, as I said, our gorgeous staff team. Um, so that's uh, what my role is. Um, and yeah, as I say, please do let me know if you've got any questions. Um, a bit about uh, me, if you're interested in doing a job like mine or you're interested in how somebody gets a job like mine. Um, so um, uh, many, many, many years ago, I studied drama and theatre studies at uh, university um, and uh, used to be accused by my lecturers of cheating my degree because I liked to write lots of essays, but I didn't like performing. Um, and I'd gone to university very much thinking, wow, I, I love theatre and I love um, social impact and um, I love theatre as a space that brings together community and creates dialogue and enables people to feel welcome. Um, but I don't really like performing <laughs> and I don't really know uh, if there's um, space for me in this world, but it's something I'm so passionate about. So that's why I studied um, theatre studies at uni. Um, and then after uni, I went to work for a boarding school for two years where I got given really big budgets to put on really outrageous shows um, while also working for their semi-professional theatre. Um, and that was crazy and wild and great fun. And I tried loads of different roles from um, producing and directing all the way through to uh, making costumes um, and being a wardrobe mistress. So um, really great in terms of, there's, I don't think there's many opportunities in our industry to try things in quick ways um, and see if you like it. So you might think, um, oh, um, running a wardrobe sounds really interesting, but I don't understand how I could experience that or know what it's like. Um, and so that role was amazing for me for um, just trying a diversity of different opportunities. But also I think it's helped me in what I've gone on to do, um, have some small understanding and rhetoric for talking to people about their roles. 
um, because I've done such a kind of smattering of different roles, um, including um, our theatre manager always laughs at me because I used to have to do things like uh, run the lighting desk um, of that semi-professional theatre for kind of big name comedians as they came to the outer reaches of um, uh, Rutland where I was based. So I did that for two years. Uh, after that, I went and did a graduate trainee skip, um, ship at a big regional theatre, learned a lot in a very short space of time, um, and then went to the Old Vic in London to um, work in their development department, um, specifically working on their capital campaign. Um, and uh, from there, spent two years there, from there went to um, be um, the head of uh, fundraising and marketing, so comm specifically, for a brilliant arts festival called Greenbelt, um, which I was there for a year. It was great fun. I quickly realised I wanted to be back in theatre. And so um, went from there to um, be head of development at The Gate, which is another great pub theatre uh, in Notting Hill. It's an arts council funded pub theatre, so it feels quite different, interestingly, to um, The King's Head. Um, I was there for two years and then I've been at The King's Head for just over three, three and a half years now. Um, so that's kind of a bit about um, who I, kind of where my background was and how I managed to get the job that I have today. Um, in terms of The King's Head, I can talk a little bit about um, what we've been up to in the last um, six months since the theatre shut. Um, that might be of interest. Um, so um, on March the 16th, obviously, um, theatres across the country were told that they would have to shut with immediate effect. Um, that was true for us as much as it was for anyone else. And a venue like ours um, doesn't really have the same kind of fundraising model that other organisations do. So about 10% of our income every year is fundraised. Um, and a huge part of that comes from individuals in our community rather than coming from um, big grants or trusts and foundations. And so um, those individuals tend to give um, at, often they tend to give um, at, on a night when they're in the theatre, they see the work, they engage with it, they love it and they give whether that's 50p or five quid, um, and that in turn builds up and produces about 10% of our income. But unfortunately, about 90% of our income is earned through ticket sales. Um, and so for a venue like the King's Head, shutting overnight is such um, a drastic um, and difficult thing. Um, and it was definitely quite a shock to have to make that decision, especially make it so instantly. Uh, hence why I can remember that it was March the 16th and it's burned into my brain. Um, I, we're, we're, because we're a charity, the King's Head, we're overseen by a board of trustees um, and our chair is um, the brilliant producer, James Seabright. Um, and our board of trustees are incredible. They're a kind of um, a group of professionals who are able to um, give you advice and guidance and ultimately have this overarching view of the king's head and where it's headed rather than the individual staff team members behind below it so um they provide a kind of uh, grounding for the charity um and so look, they're really helpful in terms of being able to have conversations about um how we run the business and big decisions we might have to make like shutting the venue um so we shut on march the 16th um and instantly i think the question that adam and i asked ourselves is what is it that is unique about the King's Head? If the King's Head was to shut overnight, what would be missing? Not just from the theatre industry, but also from Islington and also from the wider world. Like, what would people be losing? And I think there's a couple of things that for, it's our 50th birthday this year and for the last 50 years we've been known for um, and that um, would, would not exist without us. And some of the key ones are um, connection in particular for the LGBTQIA plus community, um, both to dialogue about that community, but also with others outside of it. So um, a creation of tolerance um, understanding and um, better dialogue, um, seeing not just seeing heterosexual relationships on stage as a normal thing. Um, that's a massive part of our history and it continues to be so today. It's hugely important to what we do. Um, people feeling like it's a safe space that they can feel welcomed in. Um, the other thing, of course, is opera that we do, and um, uh, particularly really radical, punchy opera. Um, one of the things I've actually really loved about um, arts lockdown at the minute is the amount of really accessible opera that usually is incredibly unaffordable. So, for example, the Met Opera in New York is currently screening um, all of its work. There's a different opera a night that you can watch for free online. 
And that's amazing. And to be honest, we can't compete with that. Um, so when we were thinking about like, what is the space that is unique? Go watch the beautiful, incredible back catalogue of work from venues like The Met that is currently free. It's incredible. And personally, I can't normally afford to pay 250 quid for a ticket to go to the opera. So it's great to see it um, and enjoy it while it is free and accessible. Um, and then the, um, the kind of third thing that we do and I think is unique about the King's Head and we really care about is um, we're really passionate about everyone feeling that they should have the opportunity to make work and being getting behind those artists. And so that's, um, that's quite a, a big statement. I always think it's slightly like um, in Ratatouille, the film where uh, anyone can be a good cook, but um, you need to be passionate about it and brave to make really great art. So a little... little <laughs> strange Disney reference for you but um that's kind of my belief about theatre as well anyone should be able to make theatre and some key things that stop people from being able to is uh, often access to really great training that's affordable um I think directing masters in the UK are outrageous in terms of how much they charge and the limited uh, access they actually give you to the industry um you leave with um being told that the most important thing is um, craft and skill, whereas actually I think a lot of it is um, people being able to give you a chance and an opportunity and doors being opened to you. Um, and so one of the reasons why we run our trainee director scheme is to try and open those doors. So to let a new generation of artists feel that the doors to the industry are open to them and that they can leave with um, a little black book of connections rather than the same people generation after generation making our work. How do we change who makes our work? Well, one of the biggest ways is we, we open doors for people. Um, and the other way that we um, we get behind those kind of that, that mantra of everyone should have the opportunity to make work and then see themselves on stage is um, we specifically work with um, emerging companies. Um, so all forms of artists and support um, emerging companies um, who are often making incredible work rather than cherry picking individual artists, working out, right, you already have a great collective. How can we get behind that, support you, help you understand budgeting, whatever it is, marketing, maybe that's you're doing that kind of thing for the first time. How can we support you, give you guidance? Um, just have an open door that you can ask any question. Um, and when we looked at um, what lockdown looked like for us, I think the big thing we realized at the King's Head is that was the group of individuals who were going to feel incredibly isolated at this time and like there was very little hope in our industry. I think there's a lot of really negative things that have been said in the last couple of months by big arts leaders. And the two that I think are really outrageous and not right are that the only way theatre will reopen is by um, a return to a lot of free work. And I think that's rubbish. And I don't think that we can stand for that as an industry. Um, I think if we want to see a more interesting conversation and dialogue and a proper community dialogue happening in our theatres, we have to pay our artists fairly. Um, and that's everyone who's both on stage and off stage. And that just should be a non-negotiable. We shouldn't be even allowing ourselves to have a discussion where we imagine that it's OK not to pay people. Um, so that's the first thing that I've heard that's been making me really cross. Um, the other one that um, I've been hearing that, again, I think really impacts this group is that the only way venues will reopen is with really famous faces and big names. Um, and while that's true, in lots of ways, it's easy to do. We call that marquee casting, that kind of big shiny name outside the, the if you imagine the kind of 1940s venue that you would walk past and see, I don't know, Marilyn Monroe in the latest musical. Um, so while marquee casting makes some sense in many ways like you know to call a spade a spade if if I can get Benedict Cumberbatch to do a one-man show it's going to sell out in a really different way to if I perform a one-woman show for you um, while that makes sense a venue uh, of our size shouldn't be able to let themselves off that lightly like if our view is that the everyone deserves a voice on stage and everyone there'll be greater diversity and interesting conversation and society will be having a more interesting dialogue then we have to allow a more varied uh, voice to be on stage and not just the same 10 people to perform um, and that's a really scary thing to do um, to decide that um, how you're looking to reopen has to have a mix of both the kind of easy to sell things you know the famous face and a famous written by a famous author 
on a stage. Um, at the same time, that's quite hard for a venue like the King's Head to get the rights to. Um, so if you look at the kind of shows that are reopening in London at the minute, um, there's a mix of two really different things forming. So the kind of big old guard, as I would call them, of venues are opening with extremely famous faces. Um, I've been to, in the last couple of weeks, I've been going to a lot of work that is on just to see what that feels like, um, to talk to other audiences about how they feel about it, what do they feel about being back in theatre. Um, yeah, it's also a really impor important part of who I am. Um, to go to the theatre and so it's also important for me that I go um, it feels like an important part of my identity connecting with theatre um, and I think the big the, the kind of two big trends that are emerging in this this the art that is being put on is either we're seeing one-hander famous faces often by really famous playwrights um, and often those are by venues that have much higher overheads than a venue like the King's Head has. So it's always worth remembering that you might be a really large venue. So let's talk about an example that hasn't opened. If you're the National Theatre, um, yes, you maybe have more funding behind you and you have more power behind you in some ways, but also your overheads are much higher. So you have a staff team that is far bigger, obviously, than the King's Heads. The cost of your electricity is probably about equal to our turnover in a year. Um, and one of the great things, therefore, about working for a small venue is you can be nimble and quick and uh, you can move more in a much lighter way because your overheads are smaller. And hopefully that's one of the ways that the King's Head will survive this is that that nimbleness, as well as an incredible team who works really, really hard. Um, so we've seen that trend of the kind of the big guys often putting on these famous face plays. Um, and the other thing that we've seen is... Um, Fringe theatres starting to reopen with really great, punchy, tiny little programming. Um, so I went to the Eagle London um, to see um, a great musical um, last month that I just loved. Um, they've got Pippin coming up, um, but it's great to see these tiny venues reopening. I think the thing that is really hard for a venue like us is... Um, uh, you may not know this, but our building is um, not our own. So we don't own the building that we're in. We rent it from the pub. Um, our landlords are amazing. Um, Youngs are really brilliant to us and we're very fortunate. Um, but that said, um, we pay a commercial rent to be where we are. We receive no bar income and therefore ticket sales are dramatically important to us. On average in a year, our shows get about 75 to 80% capacity and we put on about 900 to 950 shows a year. So as a basic kind of run through of maths, social distancing just doesn't work for a venue like us. And I think the biggest thing we therefore thought about during lockdown was how could we still create connection with co the community, but desperately reduce our overheads um, while protecting our staff team who are also often emerging theatre makers. If we see theatre makers as a much broader definition than just somebody who directs work, but all forms of people who enable us to put on art. Um, so a lot of the people who work for the King's Head, the role that they have, it's the first time that they're in that role. And so how can we support them as much as the artists that you might see on stage? Um, and so um, we are really fortunate that we have avoided redundancies in our core staff team, um, which is amazing and there is only there's only one reason that that has happened and that's thanks to the fundraising that we did at the start of lockdown which resulted in us raising 150,000 pounds off our audience members 35,000 pounds of which was from the arts council it's the first time the king's head has had arts council funding since 1992 so it's really dramatic for us the impact that that has had um as well as being i would say it's quite emotionally dramatic the impact it's had to have that many audience members behind us so we've had over a thousand unique donations um, and I'm, I think I talk a lot when I talk about fundraising about the value that it is of everybody giving at a level that is appropriate to them. And so there's some really big donations in there and they're amazing. Um, and those donors have massively helped how we have managed to support our staff team at this time. But at the same time, there are artists in there that have made me cry as I've seen them give five pounds when I know they don't really have it. Um, and it's actually that volume that has made the difference to the King's Head. If we'd got 100 donations, I think we'd be in a really different place of kind of people who view that it only you can only give a donation over a certain level. But because we've got 
that real scale. It's one of the reasons why we've managed to survive um, to this point. Um, so I'm, for anyone who is watching who has been part of that in whatever way is, um, is appropriate to you to have given if that's you had a ticket um, with us and you chose not to ask for a refund. I'm hugely grateful. It truly has saved the fate of the King's Head. Um, uh, the other big thing that we um, have done that has been impactful to us and how we're surviving at this time is uh, the furloughing of our staff team. So um, I currently work part time and I'm supported by um, two incredible, incredibly talented um, junior members of staff who are um, pretty badass for being um, so new in the industry. So um, my absolutely brilliant assistant, Layla, and our glorious marketing assistant, um, Shardy. Um, so it's just the three of us at the minute that are behind the king's head. Um, Shardy and Layla um, mostly run the show and then I do a lot of things um, like financial modelling and liaising with the board and then um, some major funding applications as well. That's kind of more what I'm, I've been looking after recently. Um, so things like applying for the Big Arts Council um, Cultural Recovery Fund that has just closed. Um, that's more what my job is at the minute. And it's quite interesting talking to other executive directors. We have a brilliant network um, of uh, about 40 exec directors that meet up on Zoom once a fortnight and uh, connect over email, which is incredibly helpful. Peer support is so useful in this job. It feels very lonely right now without it. So um, yeah, really appreciate that group. But um, I think it's interesting to see how a lot of arts leaders in the last six months have ultimately just become um, fundraisers and um, financial planners um, and all this, all the reason why we use, why we got into theatre, for me, that's definitely around art, but also community connection and social space. I really passionately believe that theatre should be a space in our society where everyone feels welcome and everyone feels that they have an opportunity to feel heard and have their voice heard. And I think it's really hard at the minute if you run an organisation and don't have, you're not creating that space that you would usually, you know, how do you still power through day by day what is ultimately quite a stressful and tiring job when the work isn't there um i'm i'm incredibly lucky to to have those um those two amazing colleagues working with me at the minute but the rest of our team are furloughed um and their that furlough scheme has been incredible that said the furlough scheme ends on the 1st of november and one of the big things that we're doing now is working out, right, well, if this is if this is our reality now, as we look at um, another kind of what I can only describe as a micro lockdown um, coming on Monday, um, if this is what the reality of what um, running a theatre looks like for now, um, then how can we make sure that um, work continues to be free and accessible for those people who really need it? So for me, that, that continues to be the thing that is unique about the King's Head, is that access to vocational trainings, particularly for emerging companies. So allowing groups of people to feel that all forms of theatre making are valid and that you don't have to put a label on your work. So you don't have to be a producer to apply to this scheme or an actor to apply to this scheme, but you can just make theatre. And that also means you could be an incredible administrator who wants to develop their craft of, in the future, maybe doing my job. Great, come, come get me. Um, and so um, we're looking at what the autumn looks like um, around uh, platforms like this um, and how we can keep engaging with you guys for free um, and hopefully giving you connection and community. And a lot of this work has been done by um, people behind the scenes, people you don't maybe see. Um, and so like a big credit to Shardy, our incredible marketing assistant, who has been putting together a huge amount of the program that you would have, programming you would have seen for KHT Online recently. Um, and um, her voice has come through incredibly at this time. She's kind of, she's almost like a micro artistic director for this online programming, which is just so exciting to see what um, the voice that she's created and the space that she's created. Um, and if you are an emerging artist, we now have um, a, a Facebook um, space, I'm gonna call it pages groups, weird language and rhetoric, but a space that you can come to um, and find support and uh, networking and hopefully some some peers as well at this time. Um, we're also modeling different ways we will reopen at the minute. Um, I'm working with um, the brilliant Heather Ruck, who uh, is the former head of programming for Assembly Festivals. 
and um, was a King's Head Theatre board member. She's working with us in the interim um, as our artistic director is outgoing um, on um, what, what can programming look like at the King's Head um, for the future. And so watch this space. Um, we don't have anything immediately in the pipeline. You're not going to see us opening next week. There's some um, there's some strange quirks around um, how social distancing in venues works. And the kind of two problems for the King's Head are firstly, we're 110 seats. Um, so it's quite hard to make the financial numbers work. So even if I socially distance everybody, if I allow two meters around every single person, so just as a quick example, we can get to 14 people in the venue, one four. Um, and that includes the cast and the lighting technician and our box office or usher. If we reduce that and go to one meter social bubbles and kind of really try and play with the numbers, we can get up to about 26. Um, but unfortunately we break even for most shows. So the point where we start to not make a loss um, at around selling about usually 70 to 80 seats. That's where we start to not lose money. Um, so it's it's obviously not only is it dramatic, um, but uh, it's also um, impossible financially to make work like that. Even if we were to fundraise really hard and support that, the other the other kind of big problem that the King's Head has is the actual nature of the space. So to access our space, you have to walk through the pub. Um, you would usually on a night queue up very close to one another um, inside the pub. Obviously inside's not great already. It's not great social distancing wise. And then for anyone who's used the King's Head lose, you have to go down the staircase um, in a way that it's impossible to be anything other than kind of as close as possible to people. So we would have to think about things like how would you build port loos um, and how would you allow members of the audience to use the loo in a way that still enable people to be safe. So there's all these kind of weird quirks that maybe you might not think you would think, oh, well, eat, what happens if they just spread people out? Why can't they put them work? So there's kind of odd things that are the reasons why we love the King's Head, that kind of weird, awkward space that you kind of have to squeeze pipes people to get in that just don't work in um, a world like this. Um, that said, we are thinking about those things. We're trying to think creatively. We've loved how people have engaged with this space. So thank you for being here today or for watching me um, later on. Um, but it's it's about working out um, how do we, when we reopen, keep our audiences safe, keep our artists safe um, and still keep creating work that is inspiring and exciting. Um, I've seen someone just um, popped in a question asking if Michelle, so Michelle is our brilliant producer, is leaving. No, so Michelle is still with us. She's still, she's furloughed at the minute, but um, being as the probably the world's most active arts um, commentator on Twitter, um, if you're interested and want to follow her. So um, she is very much still part of the King's Head family. So it's Adam, our um, artistic director of 10 years, who is leaving. Um, it's actually his last day tomorrow, which is very sad. Um, uh, but yes, he's um, he's really, he's leaving at a, um, a really strange time, I think. It's a really sad time to see him go, but he's also been a part of the King's Head for a really long time. So um, yeah, it will be, we'll be celebrating um, on Zoom tomorrow to say goodbye to him. Um, uh, Jordan's asked um, our marketing assistant, Shardy. She's actually around posting for me, I can see. Um, so yes. Um, just if anyone needs a recommendation of my one of my favorite my two favorite people to work with Charlie and Leila keeping my life um moving smoothly at the minute um I think um I guess the other thing that might be just briefly before I finish quite interesting to think about is if you're um thinking about how does work reopen I'll just tell you some of the things that we're also having to consider so um if the world remains at the way it is currently if social distancing is here to stay um, some of the other things that we're looking at is um, how, what spaces are there that we could take over elsewhere? Why does the King's Head have to be defined by just a building? Um, the King's Head has always been um, wild and free and um, edgy and uh, maverick. So maybe it doesn't involve um, the pub if we can't get into it. Maybe it involves performing outdoors or maybe it involves performing more online. Um, maybe why does Panto have to be in a building? Maybe you could do something else that's different um, and interesting. Always hard with the British weather to say stuff like that. Um, if we could guarantee it was going to be sunny every day, no problem. Let's go outdoors. Let's make work. 
Um, but I think there's um, there's interesting things that are definitely coming um, out of this as people explore, well, how can um, removing the things that we said were non-negotiable, so the building, say, if we remove those, actually let's ask fundamental questions about who this work can be for and who can perform in it. Um, and some of the work we're therefore working really hard on at the minute is um, trying to just check in with who we are and what our non-negotiables are. And so things like we've just published a new anti-racism policy, really trying to challenge ourselves on um, who makes this work and who has access to this work. And in five years time, who's going to be running the king's head? Like who's next? And how is that? How are we making sure that um, we can provide the best opportunities for people and keep conversations and dialogues open, but also allow people to challenge us if we're getting stuff wrong? Um, and you can find that on our website if you're interested. Um, and I think that there is a, there is space in this time, especially until Christmas, to ask really challenging questions of ourselves that usually we would say we don't have time for. It's really hard when you're putting on 950 shows a year to breathe and um, ask questions about why you do stuff and do you just do it because that's the way you've always done it. Um, and I'm really grateful for the people around um, me, so both team, but also our board and also the wider community who are asking really challenging questions and helping us make really bold decisions about the King's Head. Um, and that's questions like, um, when we look at um, fringe theatres, um, what's, what space is required? Like what space is needed by people? And that probably isn't another 100 seat pub theatre. And so for us, the new building um, that we have planned, um, so it's a 250 seat main space and an 85 seat studio next door, that's become really, really important during lockdown. We've realised that, um, that a lot of emerging artists have access to a space for a month at a time and then have to leave that space. And that um, freelance culture has just made a whole generation of artists feel incredibly adrift and unsupported at this time. Um, and trying to find how venues can feel like homes, I think is really important. And interestingly, something that we do as audiences, so we often have views of what our home theatre is, um, and that regional theatres are so great at doing, but um, that often we don't provide that same support or network for our freelancers. So we're kind of trying to ask these questions of ourselves. Um, Simon's just asked me on Facebook, what about online live streaming that allows vulnerable and older people access and greater audience size? I know it's not being there, but as you say, that's challenging with distancing. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the problems um, when we opened, um, uh, when we started at lockdown, was the amount of um, online content that was being produced by venues. And I think some of that work um, is incredible and was amazing. I watched One, one Man, Two Governors from The National and I loved it. Um, that was really fun and it was really easy to get a ticket because it was free and online for everybody. Um, if I'm honest, it's hard to compete with the quality of video footage that larger organisations are able to produce. So for example, um, the version of Hamilton, the musical that is on Disney Plus at the minute, was filmed over four nights of the production using multiple cameras set up in multiple different locations. And then they also got the cast to come in and do one-on-one -on -one songs and shots and static setup. So it's this huge, huge process. It's not just a still that has then been woven together to try and create something that is interesting because the joy of theatre is that you can, um, you can be your own cameraman. So rather than when we watch film, we sit statically and engage with it in one way, you might be really interested in what the secondary character is doing, even though someone's delivering a monologue. And so often when you go to the theatre with someone, if you talk to them about, oh, like, what did you think of it? They'll have a completely different view of it to you, unlike often if you go to the cinema, which is one of the things I adore about live art. It's so different. We kind of curate our own experience. And it's really hard to try and give that feeling when you're watching statically. And we just can't compete financially with the amount of, work that would be required to put on stuff in a in a filmed way I also don't think it's the same which is why we have to ask big questions of ourselves like what is unique about the king's head which is why we think committing to this form of online program where anyone can ask any question and feel that that the kind of um the secret offices admin offices are open to them is really important um but that's so that's really hard that said I completely agree that if you are a regional artist 
London is a really expensive city to come to and to watch a lot of work with. And so there's a good challenge to us there as well about it is a time where perhaps we're um, decentralising um, the UK. Um, London doesn't have that same centralisation in terms of art. So how can we maybe help better support um, regional artists at this time? Really great question. Um, I'm aware I'm over time, but I will whiz through. Um, Jordan has written, I'd love to work with the King's Head on a kind of supported theatre making project that specifically and uniquely connects with communities. Having just come out as queer, congratulations, Jordan, while being of a modern religious background and having an intersectional experience as a neurodiverse person. I think there are great opportunities to make work that could be accessible online or in takeaway, uh, takeover venues in an interactive or creative, curated way. Would you be open to a Zoom call to think out loud about something related? So yes, totally. We are like, we're so, challenge us, bring on new work, bring up new ideas, um, give us things to get excited about, talk about the communities that we're not represented. Um, that's, that's definitely the space that is coming in this autumn, um, I think is a reset and a refresh for the King's Head. A kind of questioning of, like when we say that we're really open to, programming diverse LGBTQIA plus communities, are we actually representing those communities and whose voice is missing? Um, like challenge away, bring your work, bring your ideas, so exciting. Um, that's That should be the space that we have right now. Um, I, I also believe that the only way I, like I'm a white cis woman who has one experience um, and I, I desperately need other artists to help me um, talk about other experiences and relevancy and um, and I can't be in charge of programming by myself in that respect um, especially having having no artistic director at the minute um, from Friday like we we suddenly have this space to to pause and think and question um, who needs to be platformed and who needs to have their voice heard um, and that's, I think, why one of the most important things we can do as arts leaders at the minute is say, for the next year, we really, we really need to heavily invest in our future artists um, because in a year's time, we're going to desperately need that work. We're not going to need to go back to the work that was there when we shut theatres. Like, we're, the world not only will have moved on, but we as well as individuals will have moved on. And how will we have space that um, enables everyone to feel welcomed and heard and um expressed and um as i say I, I like i only have my lived experience and i desperately need other people to challenge me on that when it comes to the work that needs to be seen on our stages um i think probably the most important thing i could say about leading an arts organization is um you have to be up for having really tough conversations about um your own views um like your own desire of work that you're passionate about and um, i have a weird niche interest in um really existential um polish spiritual theater it doesn't really work in a london theater market and that's okay that's my um, that's my unique passion um and interest that i can uh, find elsewhere so i'm like aware that that is a thing but sometimes the stuff, maybe my tendency towards other work also needs challenging. And it's really helpful for people to bring on new ideas. Um, so I think definitely my hope is always that the King's Head's prog programming is as broad as possible. And that anyone feels that they are welcome to pitch any play, um, any musical, any opera. And um, part of the reason why we don't define genre or define style is because anything should be welcome on the King's Head stage. Um, and I think as we look forward to 2021 and how we will reopen and what we will reopen with, that has to continue to be a part of the core of who we are, supporting other artists and other companies and theatre makers about the work they're really passionate about and giving them platform and helping raise them up and be heard. Um, yeah. Um, those are all the questions I've got. I'm aware I'm over time as well. Um, thank you so much for um, joining me today. Um, if you um, do want to follow on with anything that I said, um, you're interested about anything to do with the King's Head or um, or how we run it, or you want to you want to challenge me um, and help me um, make a better King's Head for the future, um, you can find me on email. Um, I'm Fiona.office at kingsheadtheatre.com. Um, so drop me a line. Um, I will do my best to reply. Um, or you can find me on Twitter. 
and Instagram, um, just to blow your minds. I'm very passionate about ultra running as well. And so you'll find me, my username is English Runs. Um, my accounts are mostly about running. I apologize in advance, but if you want to reach out to me in a slightly more light touch way, you can get me on Twitter or Insta. Um, thank you so much for joining me. Um, really great to have you. Um, stay safe, everyone. Um, loads of love.